Hello scrappers and welcome to part three of where is the gold hiding in electronic waste. And today we're going to talk about my absolute favorite subject. We're going to talk about IC chips. Because IC chips for me have been a very reliable source of gold. I get a lot of gold. I get the bulk of the gold I get every year. Scrapping electronics comes from IC chips. And I'm going to talk about the different types of IC chips and where the gold is and whatnot here in a minute. I'll put links in the description to parts one and two. And maybe, you know, I'll put a link up here right now for part one. And uh, you can watch that if you haven't seen uh, the other parts. And if you stick around until the end of this video, there'll be a little bit of bonus content as a thank you for those who've actually stuck it out for a while. And I will talk to you a little bit about how to get a little bit of extra value out of some of your IC chips that you recover by scrapping out electronics uh, over and above what you might get just scrapping them out for gold. So I'll talk about that a little bit. But let's get right down to it. IC chips. I got my great bucket of scrap IC chips right here that's eh, maybe only about a third full at the moment. But... Uh, I process them from time to time and then they pile up again until I have enough to bother processing again. And I just pulled some examples out to show you what I've got here. Actually, some of these were not in the bucket because I do segregate the IC chips by type. These are only plastic chips in here. Only plastic. So uh, these ceramic processors wouldn't go in this bucket. These ceramic EEPROMs wouldn't go in this bucket. Um, these Pentium class processors wouldn't go in that bucket. And also, even though these are technically plastic, I suppose, I do not put my um, Gold Corner BGAs, or actually most types of BGAs, in here. I segregate them aside separately. Because all these things I process a little bit differently. Um, so, you know, you you got to sort them out a little bit because they require different processing. You don't, a, a ceramic uh, uh, IC, for instance, isn't going to incinerate but the plastic ones will. So you can incinerate the plastic ones to get at the gold inside, but you can't do that with the, the ceramic ones. Uh, you can't do that with these. You have to process it all a little bit differently. So I sort them out, different bins. Uh, like I say, I got plastic here in the bucket, uh, ceramic uh, EEPROMs and other ceramic logic ICs, older ceramic uh, logic ICs, processors and things. I got these uh, these sorts of processors with the pins on them, whether they're gold-plated or not. Um, I've got the, uh, the BGAs in their own group. And then these uh, pinless processors with the big copper heat sink on the back. I keep them aside um, in their own group too. So, IC chips. They come in lots of different types. Lots of different packages. I mean, these are all plastic packages over here, but you can see there's lots of different types. You've got the dual inline packages. You've got uh, flat pack surface mounts. You've got leadless chip carriers. And they come in lots of different sizes, uh, fairly big down to little tiny. In fact, they come in a lot smaller than that even. If you totally depopulate your boards, like I totally depopulate my boards in a kiln, um, You'll find IC chips on the bottom of your kiln or, or whatever deprocessing method you're using, even smaller than that. And um, I'll talk about different methods of deprocessing or depopulating because even I use different methods sometimes. I don't always put everything through the kiln, and I'll talk about that more in a little bit. But uh, if you're if you're going to be scrapping out electronics, you're going to run across a lot of ICs, and like I said up front, they are my most reliable source of gold. Okay, I get most of my gold from the ICs. I mean, people go all gaga over gold fingers. Yeah, gold connectors. Yeah, okay, they're nice and shiny and pretty and whatnot. But I'll tell you what, your average IC chip has a fair amount of gold in it. And the, the gold plating on connectors and fingers is really, really thin. Um, you know, a couple of ICs off of a board is liable to have more gold in it than all of the fingers and gold plating on uh, inside the average computer. Just a couple of the ICs inside are liable to have more gold in it. A lot of people don't realize that. And they just go after the, the easy to see gold and they throw out the rest of it or, or pass it along to um, a recycler. You know, sell the board to a recycler so that they get all the gold. When it's really actually not that hard to harvest the ICs and process them for gold. 
Now how I process the ICs, especially since different ICs go different ways, have different processing methods, that's too much for this one video. I have other videos on YouTube about how I process ICs and I'm working on even more and I'll, you know, I'll go into detail about, you know, the different types, the plastic, the ceramic, the, the BGAs, whatever. But, uh, you know, so I'm not going to go into too much detail in how, on how to get the gold out of them in this video. Uh, see some of my other videos that are already up there and ones that are upcoming. But I will give you a few hints along the way here. I already talked about plastic ICs. You can incinerate them. That will greatly reduce the amount of material you have to deal with. Um, basically, by co it'll concentrate the gold by getting rid of a lot of the other stuff, all the plastic. You know, that concentrates the gold. Um, BGA chips, uh, as you're probably aware, almost all the gold in a gold corner BGA chip is in this black blob up here. I mean this this backing part looks pretty. Looks like it's got a lot of gold in it. It doesn't. There's almost nothing there. You, it takes a whole lot of these to equal just one of these. Most of the gold is in here. This is about 1.1 percent gold. So just by tearing off the, the the fiber bottoms of these chips you're, you're already concentrating the gold. Just set these aside until you've got enough of them to make it worthwhile to process. And just process these and you'll get a lot of gold. Let me talk a little bit about all these EEPROM chips I've got up here. You notice I've got a lot of them up here. Um, most electronics, especially older electronics, is going to have a lot of these um, ceramic EEPROM chips in it. And you'll notice they, they usually have a label over the little window because these are UV erasable. Um, read-only memories. So they put a little label over the window to prevent ambient light, especially fluorescent light, from eventually erasing the contents of the EEPROMs. So what you have to do is you salvage, salvage all your EEPROMs, definitely. Usually they're socketed, which is nice. You can just pull them right out. And then peel back all the windows. All the, peel back all the labels over the windows and take a look at them. And what you'll see is they'll either have gold or no gold on the inside. I hope that's showing up. Let me try and focus a little better. So the one on the right has lots of gold in it. The one on the left doesn't. So, you know, peel the labels off your EEPROMs and take a good look at them and segregate them. Set aside the ones that have the gold in them. Now I'm not saying there's no gold or precious metals in these other ones. But, you know, if there's enough gold in them that you can see it, these are definitely worth processing. So, you know, set these aside and uh, get the gold out of these. These, you can process them if you want to, but if you can't see the gold in them, you're obviously not going to get as much. If you can see the gold, there's a lot of gold. These other EEPROMs might have another use, and I'll talk about that towards the end of the video. So don't, don't throw them out. You know, you can process them, or there might be another use for them. I'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, definitely, I've got a whole bag here full of EEPROMs that have gold inside them, holding the uh, the dye in. Some of them are really pretty. They've got a lot of gold in them. So, keep your EEPROMs and look at them. Sort them out. Now... Old school processors like this Pentium here, they don't make them like this anymore. Unfortunately, nowadays they make them like this. They've gotten they've gotten cheap, um, where they don't have gold pins on them anymore. They just have gold little uh, conductive pads on the back, and this is just very thin gold plating. So there's not a lot of gold here at all, and there's really not much in the way of gold bond wires inside these chips either, because they're flip chips with a heat sink on top. So. Other than this gold plating on the back, there's really nothing of value here, unfortunately. But the old school processors, if you get older equipment, well, they've got nice gold pins. There's probably at least a hundred gold pins right there. And underneath this black cover, if you, this is a ceramic black cover, if you crack this with like a ball peen hammer, you'll see inside there the gold bond wires going to the die. 
Now this is this is another old school ceramic processor. Now it didn't have gold pins, but what it does have is a metal cover here instead of a ceramic cover like this one. It has a metal cover made out of a metal called Kovar that is gold plated. And if you just hit this with a propane torch for a few seconds, um, it'll melt the solder holding this plate on. The plate will fall off. And then you can see all of the nice gold bond wires inside going to the die. So um, that's two ways to get into these chips and get the gold inside them. Or you can just bust them up with a hammer. Some people do that and then process them. But uh, um, like I said, you could just heat it up and make the cover come off. Actually that'll probably work on the ceramic one too, although it's it's more convenient just to to bust the ceramic one with a, with a ball peen hammer. Get your ram sticks here. Yeah there's there's gold fingers on the ram sticks but I'll tell you what there's a lot more gold in the ram chips on the ram sticks. So depopulate the ram stick boards and process the ram chips for gold and you will be surprised at how much gold there is in the ram chips. I love ram chips. They are probably my second favorite thing behind um, gold corner BGAs for gold content. And a lot of boards are going to have ram chips on them. Um, telecom boards, computer boards, whatnot. You know, and they're, they're usually going to be some sort of dual inline package like that or like that or like that in fact that is a that is actually that's not ram that's oh well, yeah that's flash ram right there that's a flash ram I recognize the number so uh, and these chips are gonna have a lot of gold in them basically with IC chips every pin on the outside is gonna lead to a gold little gold wire on the inside that's going to the IC chip die inside. So the more legs you have generally the more gold bond wires you have inside. Now a chip like this has about 200 legs on it so I'm expecting this chip right here to have a whole lot of gold in it. You know and these BGA chips well every little ball on the bottom is a connection and every one of those is going to have a gold bond wire connecting to the die inside. So that's why I like the BGA chips so much because they have a lot of gold in them and not a lot of junk metal. These older dual inline packages, they have a lot of legs on them. And these older flat pack packages, they have a lot of legs on them. And that all that junk metal in the legs just gets in the way of getting the gold. The BGA chips, once you peel the bottom part off, there's nothing but a little bit of epoxy in your way. And that burns right off when you incinerate your parts. So that's another reason I love the BGA chips, although I, I have found good ways to process these plastic chips too. Now where are you going to find IC chips? Well, pretty much everywhere in electronics. They're everywhere. Um, older electronics are going to have more of these, uh, these type of uh, dual inline packages here. Uh, newer electronics are going to have some more of these flat packs, leadless chip carriers. Um, BGA chips, but uh, they're all good for gold. Um, my favorite place to get BGA chips is A, telecom equipment, because usually there's a lot of BGA chips inside telecom equipment. And I have a lot of videos about um, depopulating telecom boards and getting the BGA chips off of them. But another place to get them is uh, motherboards, computer motherboards. Now this is a motherboard out of a small laptop and um, it has a gold corner BGA chip here. Almost every computer motherboard is going to have at least one gold corner BGA chip on it. And that's either the North Bridge or the South Bridge, I'm not sure which. And then usually it has another big chip over here which is a flip chip. That's the opposite. If this is the North Bridge, that's the South Bridge or the other way around, I don't know which. Now the flip chip generally doesn't have anything of value in it, but the gold corner BGA sure does. And there's a lot of other IC chips on this motherboard too. And they are get down to really, really tiny, tiny, tiny ones. And they're on both sides of the board. There's some flat packs, flat packs, uh, tiny dual inline packages, all surface mount, all comes off pretty easy. Here's another laptop motherboard. Got a gold corner BGA on it, big flat pack, lots of little tiny chips, another BGA here. On this side, well, there's the there's the flip chip that's pretty much useless. You'll learn pretty quick 
um, which chips have uh, gold in them and which don't. If you're in doubt, um, take a chip like this. You know, if you want to know if there's gold in it, usually there is. There's almost always gold in a chip like this. But if you just take a couple pairs of pliers and you snap it in half and then look at it with a microscope or a, a high-power loop, you should be able to see some gold bond wire sticking out in there. And you almost always will. It's rare to run across chips that don't have any gold in them. They're out there, but it's pretty rare to run across chips that don't have any gold. Okay, so here's, uh, here's a board off of um, an old-school CD-ROM um, CD player. And it's got a great big flat pack on it, a couple dual inline chips, a couple of really small chips. So they're everywhere, everywhere inside computers. Here's, here's from a printer. Uh, it's got a little gold quarter BGA on it, big flat pack, lots of small chips. On both sides it's got chips. Here's, I think this came out of a printer too, I'm pretty sure. Um, so this has some chips, some dual inline chips soldered in, and it had one that was socketed, which I took out. I think it was an EEPROM. So here's an old school computer board, came out of a spectrophotometer that I tore apart a while back. Um, it had a lot of socketed ICs, which I have harvested all of them. And I've used a heat gun to take a couple of IC chips out that I wanted to save, be particularly delicate on and save, because they were actually going to be used in one of my retro computing projects. Um, but the rest of this will go in the kiln and all of the board, all of the rest of the soldered in ICs will get depopulated. So that brings up depopulation methods. So you know, I, I use a kiln and it works pretty good for getting pretty much everything off the boards, especially if they're surface mount. Like all the stuff on this board right here is surface mount. So as soon as I put this in the kiln and heat it up above the temperature of melting solder, all these parts will just fall right off the board. That makes life really easy. This board, a lot of this stuff is mounted through hole, so it's a little more difficult to get off. I usually have to shake and bang the board a little bit to get everything to come off, but eventually it usually does. Now, I'll also on this board I've used a heat gun, and a lot of people swear by heat guns. And um, they do work. I'll say that. They do work. Um, but it's slow and it's very targeted like you get one IC off at a time I took this IC off I took this IC off on this board this board had some uh, some gal chips on it I wanted some reprogrammable logic chips and some RAM chips I wanted for one of my uh, retro computing projects so I used the heat gun and I just very targetedly used um, took off the chips I wanted and that's great if you've got all day to depopulate one board. So that's why I use a kiln for you know mass depopulation. I'll load the kiln up with a dozen boards and depopulate them all in, a, in the space of an hour. You know, and, and I could go do something else during the course of that hour. So yeah, as I said, I used a heat gun to take a few parts out of this board and some parts out of this board. So here's one of the heat guns I use, and this is a small Unger. And it's, it's very, it has a very small tip, very targeted um, heat, allow you to take out just one component at a time without, you know, damaging a lot of the others around it. Here's the other heat gun I have, it's a big we uh, Weller, and this one puts out a whole lot of heat. And this would depopulate a bunch of parts all over the board. Puts out a lot of heat though, it will damage other stuff. So. But again, you know, this would be faster if I wasn't worried about damaging stuff. I just wanted to get stuff off the board. This is, like I said, more targeted. If I wanted to be very precise and take off a few chips for reuse without damaging other things, that's what, this is what I would use. And then, of course, the rest of the time, when I don't care and just want all the parts off the board, I've got everything off that I want to be delicate with, it all just goes in the kiln, everything comes off. And by the way, the kiln... You would think it would be very destructive, but uh, what happens is the kiln warms up to the point where the solder melts and the parts fall off the board, and they fall to the bottom of the kiln where I have a catch basin. Well, the temperature in the kiln is stratified. It's hotter at the top and cooler at the bottom. So once the parts fall off and fall to the bottom of the kiln, they're in much cooler air, much cooler environment, and they don't sit down there and cook. 
And what I have found actually, surprisingly, is a lot of the parts that I have depopulated off the boards in the kiln are actually still good afterwards, can be reused. Um, I have an IC chip tester and programmer and I will sometimes take some ICs off the bottom of the kiln and say, oh, that's, that's a useful little RAM chip or that's, that's a useful little EEPROM chip and I'll test it and it's like, holy cow, it's still good. Wow, cool. Um, other people will use like a, an air hammer or air chisel and just chisel everything off the board. And that's pretty quick too. It's pretty destructive, it's pretty messy, but it works. And it's a method I have considered using too. But, you know, I have kilns, I might as well use them. But if I am ever without a kiln and I need to depopulate some boards, I may get myself an air chisel just to get all of the IC chips off. Another method of depopulating boards I've, I've seen other people talk about, and actually I've seen it demonstrated in a few YouTube videos, is using a hot sand bath to uh, melt the solder on the boards and get the parts to fall off. It's a process I have tried but really haven't worked with all that much. I, I haven't really got it to work well for me. The kiln works better, the heat gun works better, um, but that's another option for you. If you, it seems like a fairly gentle way of, of depopulating boards using the hot sand bath. Kind of like um, when I use a heat gun to targeted, targeted heat to remove a single IC chip. You know, it's fairly gentle. I would think that the hot, hot sand bath would be a, a fairly gentle way to get IC chips off for reuse or resale. So that's something to think about. It's not something that I've managed to get to work for me very well, but for, it works for other people. And of course, when it comes to depopulation, if you've got a lot of IC chips in sockets, well, then it's really simple. Just pull them right out of the sockets. You can do it with a screwdriver. You can get an IC chip puller tool, whatever. And just pull them right out of the sockets. Takes no time at all. Now, you might want to be a little careful taking them out. Because coming up next, we're going to talk about how you can get a little extra value out of your IC chips. And being careful with how you remove them from the board can add value to them. Or at least not detract more value from them. So, here's your bonus content what you can do with your IC chips to get more value out of them than just extracting the gold. Check out these IC chips. Now you may look at these and think, oh my god, look at all the gold on those IC chips. Yeah, not only do they have the gold-plated co Kovar lids on them, these old-school white ceramic IC chips, they've also got gold-plated legs. There's a lot of gold here. Uh, this old-school purple ceramic EEPROM chip with the with the gold lid and the gold legs. You think, oh, there's a lot of gold there. I could render those down for gold. Yeah, you can. And you probably get a few bucks in gold out of each one. But I'll tell you what. You put these on eBay, you put these on some other online service and sell them, you'll probably get a lot more money for them. Um, number one, they're pretty. They're collector's items. Uh, number two, People who are into vintage computing or retro computing or just need spare parts for an old, old machine, they will pay good money for these original ICs, uh, these old school type ceramic ICs. Um, if you pull them out of working equipment and can tell people that they're working or you have a way of testing them uh, to make sure that they're working and you can certify that they're working, you'll get even more money for them when you sell them. So, these are not the type of ICs that I would render down to get the gold out of them. These are ICs that I would sell. And you'll get more money for them that way. In fact, there's a lot of ICs that you can sell and get more money for than you'll get the gold out of them. Like, um, if you scrap a bunch of Pentium computers, you're going to wind up with a lot of these Pentium processors. Well, these will resell. You may only make a buck or two a piece, but that's probably more then the little bit of, of gold plating on the back of it here. You know, because, you know, if you scrap these out, all you're going to get is a little bit of gold plating and a little bit of copper. You know, you, maybe, I don't even think you'll make a buck a piece, you know, between the two. But you could easily make a couple of bucks on a good used Pentium processor. What is this thing? It's a uh, Core 2 Duo. 
But I have a bunch of uh, i3s, i5s, probably even a few i7s laying around. That was just the one handy that I grabbed. And those will resell. You know, especially if they come out of working equipment. Pack them and ship them well. People will buy them. Um, EPROMs. Now, these gold ones, I'm keeping. And I am going to render them down for the gold. But I'll tell you what, these other EPROMs, I have, I'm going to test them. And if they're good... I'm going to sell them because, you know, there's, there's, there's probably some gold and precious metals in here, but not nearly as much as these. But what these do have is value on the resale market. People need these. They're still in use. And rather than buying new ones, people are willing to buy used ones at a discount. And so I could easily make two, three bucks a pop on these EPROMs. You know, and that's a whole lot more than I will get out of them for gold and precious metals. Um, so that's that's definitely what I would rather do with these is sell them. There's other IC chips that you might want to consider uh, saving. Not just these uh, fancy gold-plated ones. There's others. Um, I have some here in this tube. There's a Z80 CPU in here, and there's a Z80 counter timer. I have some other ZP, Z80 peripheral chips. Um, this is a little microcontroller. This is a, a parallel I.O. Uh, processor right here. These, again, have uses. People need these, and they're willing to pay for them. Again, you're probably not going to make more than a buck or two on them, but still, that's more than the gold you'll get out of them. Uh, and there's something new that I've seen um, taking off lately. And uh, I've actually had to pay for this, so I know it's out there. Is buying complete chipsets for retro computers, where if you depopulate enough boards and get enough chips, you can put together a set. Say, okay, I need an EEPROM, I need a Z80, I need a CTC, I need a parallel, I need a, a okay, I need a serial I/O, and you can put together a chipset for somebody who's building a retro computer and sell that online for good money. And, you know, people, rather than trying to hunt down each individual chip and pay, uh, you know, the new old stock price, you can just sell them this at a little bit of a discount. You make some money, and they're happy. Uh, because you're certainly going to get more money selling the chipset off than you would with all of the, the effort and chemicals that's going to go into it to extract a little bit of gold that's in here. That's another way to make a little bit of extra money from your IC chips over and above just rendering them for their gold. Um, RAM sticks. Those will resell as well. Um, some of them, nobody wants them because they're too low uh, of a density or they're too common, too old, whatever. But uh, if you tear apart a lot of telecom equipment like I do, sometimes they have specialized uh, RAM in them. It's not the run-of-the-mill stuff, and it could be in demand. It always, it's always a good idea to look up the part numbers and see if they are reselling before you render them for their gold, because you might actually get a whole lot more money for them as they are than as the gold. You know, anything that's kind of old or unusual, it's always worth looking up to see if there's any kind of demand for it um, before you just you know, render it down for its gold. It's always a good idea. And uh, believe it or not, this big bucket of IC chips, I have looked through this bucket. I have looked at each and every IC chip in that bucket. Um, ones that looked like they were still in good shape and could be reused, and I didn't immediately recognize that they weren't worth anything, I looked up their numbers. You know, I spent a rainy day the other day doing that when I couldn't do anything else outside, pouring down rain all day long. So I just sat at the computer looking up uh, IC part numbers to see what they were. And I set aside a few saying, oh, hey, these are useful chips. These will resell. Uh, I can use some of these in my own projects. The vast bulk of them went right back in the bucket, though, to be uh, rendered down for their gold. But, you know, I'll make a little bit of extra money off of some of them. Or, I won't spend money acquiring some of these chips. I was also saying um, it helps if you can test these chips, at least the EEPROMs. 
Uh, I have an EEPROM burner. I have an EEPROM eraser. So I can actually test all these and make sure they're good. And when I sell them, I can say, hey, I can certify, hey, these are good chips. They've been tested. I'll get a premium price for them. So here's my inexpensive little chip programmer reader writer that I've got hooked up to my laptop computer over here. And I've got one of my salvage DPROMs in it. And if I come over here, and this is already set up for this particular type of EEPROM. And if I just go and tell the software to read it, takes a few seconds. It's able to read out the contents of the EEPROM without any trouble. I consider that to be a good chip because the, the machine will tell me if uh, there's a problem with it, if it can't read it, if uh, it's not making contact with all the pins, if it's just not getting any data out of it, it'll tell me so. But uh, if I can read the chip, you know, without any trouble, I consider it to be a good chip. So I can, uh, you know, saying the chip is, is pulled from working equipment is one thing, but it's going to add a lot more value to it if you can say that it has been tested and is working. And, you know, you can do this not just with EEPROMs. This little machine will also do a lot of different types of RAM chips. It'll do programmable logic chips, uh, flash, all kinds of stuff can be uh, tested in this. And not just in the DIP packages. They provide a lot of adapters for, like, uh, leadless chip carriers and other types of packages so you can test all kinds of chips with it and see if they work and uh, so you can uh, you can resell them as tested and working and get more value out of them than you probably could by just rendering them for their gold you, you probably don't need to do that to get some money for them you can just say they were pulled from working equipment um, and you should be able to sell them without any problems. Ceramic EEPROMs, they're pretty tough. It, it takes a lot to destroy them. Um, so I'll make a little bit of money reselling these. That's how you could make a little bit of extra money off of your IC chips over and above just rendering them down for gold. That's going to bring episode three of this series to a conclusion. Now, I don't know for certain that this is the last episode in the series. This is the last one that I have planned to make. Um, there might be something in the future. Something might come along that I, I decide is worth uh, making another video about. If you have any requests for anything I haven't covered, leave me a comment in the comment section, and we'll see. Maybe if I get enough people requesting certain things, maybe I will do some additional videos in the series. As I said, the actual processes that I use for rendering down these different types of IC chips, it's way too much for one video. Each individual type of IC chip would easily fill up one video. Like what I do for ceramic chips, what I do for plastic chips, what I do for BGA chips, you know, ceramic processors, whatever. Each could be its own video. And it's going to take time, since life gets in the way, for me to crank out all those different videos. But, uh... If you have anything in particular that you would like to see me do, leave me a comment. We'll see. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope you found this somewhat interesting, informative, helpful. Uh, give the video a like. If so, uh, give it a thumbs up. Uh, subscribe to see future videos because there will be more videos coming out. Press the little bell icon to be notified when the new videos come out. And thanks for watching. Have a good one. Bye.